This program is an exploration of the paranormal. Or rather, I should say, since I'll be approaching things as a psychologist, it's about what's to be made of some of the oddest experiences that come the way of human beings. Ghosts, telepathy, clairvoyance, apparitions. Try it for yourself, they say. So maybe a night in these haunted caves will show me what it's all about. There are 18 miles of passages down here. This area, dug out by ancient Britons, is called the Maze. 2,000 years ago, Druids used these caves for ritual killings. This pool is called the Haunted Pool. A woman was drowned here by her husband, or so the story goes. Others before me have tried to spend the night beside this pool. One, I've been told, was found dead the next day. Four policemen were carried out unconscious in the morning. It's a test, I suppose, of my own sensitivity. I'd like to think the spirit of this place will get to me as well. And yet, what is there to be scared of? I don't believe in ghosts, I think. If I didn't already know the story of the caves, would I be as nervous as I'm getting now? Are paranormal happenings all in the mind? Some mind, it must be, that can dream up things that have baffled scientists and philosophers for centuries. Are they all in the real world? Some world, it must be, that can keep its secrets so hidden from objective physical investigation. are storytellers, masters of the believe it or not and the once upon a time. Common sense may tell us to reject it, but imagination always says it might be so. Many of us are prepared to take at least a gamble on the supernatural. After all, it costs us little to keep an open mind while to deny it might be the biggest mistake we've ever made. Is Britain really a land of committed believers in the paranormal? We commissioned an opinion poll of a representative sample of the population. We asked people whether or not they thought the following were true. It is possible to communicate by telepathy. 60% said, definitely, yes. Certain houses have ghosts. 59% said yes. Dreams can foretell the future. 59%. There are people who remember previous incarnations. 45% believe there are. The dead can send us messages. 30%. Nearly 9 out of 10 people believed strongly in at least one of these phenomena. How deep-rooted is this culture of belief? Where did it all begin?
believe that common sense works most of the time, but that sometimes the rules of the game are changed. Then came the fundamental change of outlook, the emergence of the scientific worldview. With it came a shift in attitudes to what's allowable, a closing down of possibilities. Newton's laws of motion became a model for the hard new science. The hardly ever of ordinary experience became the never of scientific law. For a while, few people realized what was happening, but then the reaction was one of terrible dismay. William Blake, the poet and mystic, spoke out against the slide towards materialism. What, it will be questioned, when the sun rises, do you not see a disk of fire somewhat like a guinea? Oh, no, no, I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Nonetheless, despite the protests, the scientific view caught on. The plain fact was, it brought results. All the great achievements of technology, engineering, medicine, seemed to be, if you like, the proof of the scientific pudding. Yet, even in Victorian England, a subculture of mystical belief kept going. Among Victorian psychics, none was so famous or respectable as the medium D.D. Holm. Over a period of 25 years, Holm regularly produced an astonishing display of spirit phenomena. When conditions were right, he was even seen to levitate. What are you saying to yourself? I'm saying now bend. I just wanted to bend. I said bend, bend, bend. Holm has had many imitators in the present century. But if one man has done more than anyone to awaken public interest, it's the Israeli psychic Uri Geller. What has been remarkable has been the public enthusiasm for Geller's feats, as if all along people have been harboring a secret hope that science has got it wrong. And there's no heat at all. Touch it. There's absolutely no heat. Is that solid silver, Lord Bar? Yeah, it was made by Gerards in London. <laughs> The Geller phenomenon has now been with us 15 years, with little to show that either he or his audience appeal is getting stale. Recently, Geller has turned his hand to mineral exploration by dousing over maps. And to let everyone else join in the fun, he's invented a new board game called Uri Geller Strike. I've been actually, for the last 10 years, looking for oil and gold uh, and um, diamonds very, very successfully. This is how I became so wealthy. Again, if I may be bold, I'm a multi-millionaire over and over. I think that my belief in God is very important for me, um, my friends, uh, our health, and world peace. And just not long ago, a few months ago, believe it or not, I was invited by Ambassador Max Kempelman and Senator Claiborne Pearl to meet the Russian delegation in Geneva um, and I used that moment to bombard their minds, the second man under, under uh, Gorbachev, Yuli Voronsov, and project peace into his mind. Geller has allowed people to believe once again in the possibility of things forbidden. But just how forbidden are they? While the public is encouraged to believe that science knows all the answers, we're also fed a stream of stories about the unexplained. I think people are interested in the paranormal because we all exist in a physical world which we understand and which scientists can explain. But even scientists aren't absolutely convinced that there's uh, nothing beyond the physical world. And for every one of us, the, 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 there's usually a little area, a little gap in this sort of wall of uh, physical science which allows us to sort of look out beyond. It's, a, it's as though we're sort of looking for some sort of hope that there's something more to it than all this. And for a lot of people, that might be religion. And for other people, it, it may be believing in little green men from outer space. I think if Prince Charles said that he'd seen a flying saucer, we would print it. And I think everybody would understand why we would print it as well. 
and it, would, it wouldn't need any explanation from me. What would be your ideal paranormal story? What are you waiting for? A little green man to come through that door and say to me, hello, I am the real version of E.T., and uh, I want you to ghost my story for me. And you'd stop the press and put that right across the front, Adrian? That would be news, yes. What happened in a suburb of London a few years ago didn't involve royalty, nor little green men, but an ordinary family living in a council house. A poltergeist, a noisy spirit, apparently made this its home, and the life of Mrs. Harper and her adolescent children became a waking nightmare. The story is that heavy furniture moved of its own accord. The children were thrown bodily across the room. One of the girls became the channel for the voice of an old man who had died ten years before. The case attracted the attention of the Society for Psychical Research. Maurice Gross was sent in to investigate, and he was soon joined by the experienced researcher Guy Lyon Playfair. So excited were they by what the two of them discovered that they moved into the house and worked on the case over many months making this the most thoroughly studied poltergeist phenomenon on record. Their conclusion was unequivocal. This house is haunted. Well, I think, first of all, it was um, small things lying around and uh, people reporting that they'd seen apparitions, heard voices, walking, knocking, that sort of thing. And then later on, the heavier stuff started to happen. The heavy furniture started to fly around and people reported more and more that they'd seen apparitions, although we hadn't actually seen any apparitions ourselves. Then later on, the girl went into these very serious trance states, very violent trance states, which became very worrying for us mm. indeed, very worrying indeed. Worst, it? Yes. yes. The focus of the poltergeist was Janet Harper. Everything that happened, happened around her. During the case, of course, the girl was seen to levitate by people outside in the street. The Baker saw the girl floating round the room in a horizontal position with books and toys flying round after. And he said he was absolutely terrified because she came towards the window and he thought she was going to come straight out the window. Well, she didn't. She banged the window and then went back in. An important feature of the investigation was the way evidence was recorded using objective scientific means. One day, as I, walked, as I was just about to walk into the living room, I sort of got this feeling something's going to happen and there was a noise and I flashed the camera as I went into the room. And as I went into the room, this settee went flying past me. I, I went across the hall and slept in, in the back bedroom, leaving the door open, as always. And then first thing the following morning, we were all waken up, woken up by this ferocious pounding noise and I rushed into the bedroom and the, um, the, the gas fired had... Um, sort of stepped out of the wall, bending this half-inch piece of brass pipe. You know, I mean, not even Larry Geller can do that. And this teapot uh, was over by the gas stove, and I was doing my writing. Suddenly I heard, like, this noise, like... This was on a stand. And I looked up, and there was the teapot and the stand doing a little dance on, by the side of the gas stove, like that. It was cold and empty, there was nothing on the gas stove. Before long, the case took an unexpected turn. Mysterious messages began to appear around the house, and the investigators found themselves conversing with a ghost. But here, I listen for yourself. Can you tell me where you are at the moment in the room? I took a journey. Why do you sleep on top of Janet? It's my bed. We know it's we know you sleep on the bed. Why can't Janet tell you? I'm invisible. You're invisible? Why are you invisible? So much you hang out at tea. I'll come back to the Enfield poltergeist later in the programme. But however we react to the accumulated evidence, there can be no question that we ought to take it seriously. Let's be clear. Paranormal phenomena aren't just a minor challenge to scientific rationality. If true, they'd bring the whole edifice of science down in ruins.
Not surprisingly, there's a group of skeptical scientists who do in fact take such phenomena very seriously indeed. These people don't like the paranormal. They worry about the hold that unscientific notions have on a large part of the population. They are members of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. Of new phenomena subject them to rigorous examination in a totally impartial way and keep a very open mind. I think this thinking is very dangerous. It's what we call magical thinking. They like to believe there are magical forces that they don't have to depend upon their, their own facilities and their own abilities, their own uh, resistance to negative elements in their lives. They seem to think that uh, there's some sort of a formula that they can repeat magic words or they can appeal to some sort of uh, guru someplace who will give them a solution. That's a very dangerous way to think. You have to, at the same time, balance. Uh, an openness to new ideas, no matter how bizarre, seemingly improbable, with the most rigorous skeptical scrutiny of those uh, ideas. And uh, yes, there's some conflict between them, of course. But if you only do one of those, whichever one it is, then, uh, then you don't have science. As it happens, there's another conference going on at the same time as the one in California. Across the world, in Winchester, people are gathering for a meeting about science and mysticism. Science, they'd say, may be one route to knowledge, but perhaps personal experience, revelation, is a surer guide to the nature of ultimate reality. These things occur there's no question that they do or don't occur and it's not by the permission of science that they do or do not occur they do occur and many many people have had paranormal as they're called experiences um, and have perhaps said nothing about them because they don't want to be laughed at or told that they're frauds the dogmatism of the sciences is surpasses that of the superstitions of religion that they have supplanted. I said we should take psychical phenomena seriously. If anyone should doubt that, or be inclined to think that the paranormal is socially or politically trivial, they should come to the village of Knock in Western Ireland. Knock once a tiny hamlet, is now a tourist town with over a million visitors a year, all because of a miraculous apparition. In the summer of 1879, a strange light on the gable of the church attracted the attention of the villagers. I remember the evening of the 21st of August. On passing the chapel at seven and a half o'clock, I saw a vision in which there appeared to be three figures, one that of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The figures were nearly life-size, but presenting in their mute and silent aspect that of statues. It was a very they dark night and raining very heavily. I saw a very bright light on the southern gable end of the chapel. It appeared when to I be a large there, globe of the most I saw light. distinctly the three figures and threw myself on my knees. I went in immediately to kiss, as I thought, the feet of the Blessed Virgin. I felt nothing but the wall and wondered why I could not feel with my hands the figures I had seen so plainly and distinctly. Today, the original church has been rebuilt and the apparition wall covered with a glass roof. Masses are said throughout the day and, by special dispensation of the Vatican, pilgrims are permitted to take Holy Communion twice a day. In 1985, an international airport was constructed, specifically to bring pilgrims to the shrine. But hold on, are we really to accept, without debate, that a miracle occurred at Nock? If so, then where does that leave unbelievers? I'm tempted to say that this airport is in itself a kind of minor miracle, except that there's nothing actually paranormal about the buildings and the tarmac here. 
even if we don't fully understand the faith and the politics that lie behind them. The apparition, however, that was something else. If a luminous image of the Virgin Mary really did come out of nowhere, then it's not just that we haven't got an explanation for it, it's that we couldn't have an explanation consistent with the laws of physics. Where did the energy come from? What gave the light its texture and its pattern? Miracles are trouble. They always have been. And in particular, they've been a worry to philosophers who've seen more clearly than most the dilemma that they put us in. Two centuries ago, the philosopher David Hume took a look at ordinary people's faith in miracles and came up with an argument designed to let the unbeliever off the hook. Ask yourself, he said, which is more probable, that the natural universe should, as it were, have gone off the rails, or that the human beings involved have bent the facts? This is what he said. When anyone tells me he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should have really happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other. Experience teaches us to trust the laws of nature. Experience also teaches us to trust our fellow human beings. So what are we to do when we can't have it both ways? As Hume said, we have to weigh up the natural miracle against what might seem to be almost as much of a miracle, that otherwise honest, decent human beings are telling lies or even perpetrating a deliberate hoax. Psychical research is a science and is rapidly becoming an exact science. Its object is to, is to ascertain by exact experimental methods how far the alleged phenomena of the science room can be brought into line with normality. If a man comes to us and says that he can make objects move without physical contact, we try this table on him. Since the beginning, the whole field of psychical research has been dogged by the problem of deception. We hoped it would rise by psychic power, but unfortunately we have never got it to, got it to rise by those means yet. The Fox sisters, for example, started the craze for spiritualism in America by communicating with the dead through table wrapping. Forty years later, Margaret Fox admitted she'd made the wraps herself by popping her toe joints. Silver Bell was a red Indian spirit who materialized out of thin air. Later analysis has shown that the whole thing was a fake. In the 1920s, Conan Doyle staked his reputation on the authenticity of these fairy photographs. Sixty years later, they were revealed as a schoolgirl joke. Just after the last war, crowds gathered to witness the miracle of the undying roses in a Stockport church. Recently it was revealed that the priest himself was replacing the dead flowers with fresh ones. Poltergeist cases again and again are traceable to the tricks of adolescent children. Here in Switzerland, a hidden television camera has recorded the child's central role in the proceedings. At Enfield, too, you'll remember, the focus of the activity was a young girl. What else should we know about Janet Harper before concluding that the poltergeist was supernatural? Under examination by a hypnotist, she made an interesting confession. He, he hypnotized Janet with tremendous care, knowing the background and knowing something about her, her history. And um, one of the questions he asked her was, was who's responsible for all this trouble? And she immediately replied, me and my sister. So I was listening in the corner of the room, and I thought, oh, boy, here comes a confession, you know, end of case. <laughs> Gross and Playfair creep <laughs> off home and tails between legs. 
but it wasn't like that at all. I mean, she was aware in, in her altered state that she was the cause of it. She was going through a pretty difficult time. I mean, she was around the age of puberty. In fact, the actual day of puberty was the really wild one. I mean, things went... <laughs> it was the day she went through the war, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, it was the day she was floating around and stopped the traffic and you know, everybody saw her in the street. Did she become quite violent at, at she, that time? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, have you ever tried to hold down an epileptic? Um, it, was, it was like that. It, she, we heard at one time one person on each limb. But doesn't the picture now begin to look a little different? This ordinary house containing an ordinary family in fact housed a highly disturbed young girl with the strength, if she wanted to, to overturn the furniture. Janet was on the edge of puberty. The ghost's voice asks in one of its more revealing moments, why do girls have periods? Isn't it likely that in this way, Janet was seeking attention that she could never have obtained by normal means? Gross and Playfair, however, stick to their guns. This was the case that they were looking for. If your interest is in psychic research, of course, and both our interests are in that field, um, one must always hope that you'll be in a position one day to be able to observe what one has read about over the, over the years. And if you go into a case and you see it all happening and you're quite convinced yourself it's all happening and it's all real, then, OK, what, what better position could you be in? Morris Gross himself came to the conclusion that it was Janet who was making the man's voice. But as always, he accepted Janet's own remarkable interpretation that she was simply being used by a dead man. What it all shows is that, with the best will in the world, investigation is not easy. But isn't that the whole reason for proper scientific studies? In the 1940s, there was tremendous enthusiasm for controlled laboratory research. At last, it seemed, clear fraud-proof evidence was coming forward. But then, questions began to be raised about the integrity of the scientists themselves. In J.B. Ryan's laboratory in the United States, a senior colleague was caught doctoring the apparatus to produce significant results. In a famous experiment on ESP, carried out at London University, a mathematician, S.G. Soul, claimed to be getting results so remarkable that the odds against them were greater than 100 million billion 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 to one. Later analysis of the mark sheets showed that the numbers had been fiddled by the experimenter, Soul himself. The whole story has been one of false dawns and fast eclipses. Carl Sargent, the first person to obtain a doctorate in parapsychology from Cambridge, apparently made an extraordinary breakthrough in demonstrating ESP. But a colleague who visited Sargent's laboratory had her doubts. Earlier this year, she wrote an article in which she hints very strongly that his experiments were rigged. Sargent has issued a reply. I don't care whether people think I'm a fraud. I stand by all the data I reported. I know the results were real because I was there. And my experience tells me so. So much for the objectivity of science. Instead of relying on fraud-proof methods, it comes back once again to fallible experience. OK. Which hand? Well, I'd have to say that one, wouldn't I? Yes, but actually I did put it in the hand where you thought I put it uh -huh. in. And that's called deceiving on top of deceiving. Yes. I'm going to do it again. This time it may be much more difficult. Ready? A one, a two. Which hand? Very difficult this time, is it not? Uh, uh, she's laughing, or because she saw <laughs> what happened to it, you see, but you didn't see. But it is in one of the hands. I know, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I kept it Human beings are more complicated, more subtle, and frequently more devious than perhaps many of us care to admit. The fact that people are capable of cheating is plainly a fact of human life. Yet for some reason, it still remains a surprising fact, something we'd prefer to brush under the carpet. Program. All right. How are we going to explain it, for example, when someone identifies a word chosen from a book pulled at random from the shelf? Oh, classic. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, take any two. Which one of these would you like to use? Oh, I, I choose. Well, um, I'll say this one. No, okay, fine. Then we'll uh, put your hand on top of that one. Even when we know that conjurers are professional liars, we're still not ready for a barefaced falsehood. Get the pages flexed up here. Where are the page numbers here? Okay. You tell me when to stop as I flip through this book like this. Wait a minute. They're, they're coming in lumps here. Okay, try again. Stop. 
231. Turn to page 231 in that book. But we got a problem here now, so you're going to have to hold it right up like that so I can't see. Uh, look at the top line on two, was it 231? 231. 231. Uh, and just read the top line to yourself. What was the word that you, you thought of out of the entire collection of books that they, is in the library here? The word was plain. Plain? Plain. Yes, that's close enough for government work, I think. I have written the word plain, and I got an impression of the Acropolis up at the left of the airplane. What was the picture that you had in your mind, sir? Her plane arrived on schedule in Athens. <laughs> well, I think that would do it. Well, there are only two possibilities. Either I can do something which um, all common sense and scientific uh, knowledge would tell you cannot be done by that means, or else it's a trick that you don't understand. The second solution is much more likely and answers the question just as well, except that you don't have the solution. Again, the fact that you don't have the solution doesn't mean that there isn't one. It doesn't mean it's unexplainable. It means to you it's unexplained. And that's the issue. Given our natural blind spots about the kind of things that human beings are capable of, how far should we ever go in labeling what we can't explain as inexplicable? In the light of everything we've just been looking at, would it still seem such a miracle if, even here at Knock, someone was guilty of a fraud? Hard to believe, maybe, that the whole apparition was a trick. And yet, as Hume said, the knavery and folly of men are such common phenomena that that's always going to be a better explanation than that the laws of nature have been overturned. From the beginning, there have, in fact, been numerous suggestions about how the apparition might have been got up by knavery or folly. A magic lantern, phosphorescent paint. But what's been missing is any theory of how exactly it could have been achieved, or of why anyone should have wanted to play such a mean trick on the villagers. But in 1879, there was someone who did have a motive for wanting to draw attention to a divine presence here in Knock. Archdeacon Kavanagh, the parish priest of Knock, may have been, as he was described, a sweet and saintly man. But sweetness, it seems, was no guarantee of political astuteness. Ireland was in political turmoil, with anti-British demonstrations occurring all over County Mayo. Kavanagh took the side of the authorities. In May of 1879, he publicly denounced the rebels. A few days later, Knock itself was up in arms. We've discovered a secret report sent to the British authorities in Dublin Castle, which reveals just how much trouble Kavanagh was in. Sheridan was the first to deliver a speech. He said, Father Kavanagh had endeavoured to stamp them as blackguards. He had done everything to brand them. Cries of, down with him, cut off his supplies. He should not trample on the people... Wouldn't Kavanagh have wanted to regain his authority? Yet how? A miraculous apparition wouldn't have been everyone's first thought. But in the 1870s, to wish for a miracle might not have seemed outrageous. The church had recognized nine other apparitions elsewhere. In every case, the life of the local community had been transformed. Kavanagh's attempts to browbeat his parishioners were getting nowhere. If he'd wanted to do something to create a real stir in the neighborhood, what would he have done? Perhaps the answer lies right here, a magic lantern show. Certainly, it was widely rumoured at the time that somehow or another a magic lantern was involved. And there can be no question that the testimony of the witnesses, in point after point, supports an explanation on those lines. First, the figures appeared just after the sun went down and grew gradually brighter as night fell, just as you'd expect with artificial light. Second, they glistened on the church wall and didn't in any way extend out from it, just as you'd expect if the wall was providing a projection screen. Third, the figures neither moved nor spoke, just as you'd expect from a still lantern slide. In Victorian times, religious slides were widely available. There were also numerous popular books of science and magic which set out precisely how to produce ghostly illusions of all kinds. But the problem is that magic lanterns aren't invisible. Anyone who interrupts the beam, for instance, creates an obvious shadow on the wall. At knock, the witnesses approached and even touched the figures. How then could the lantern apparatus have been concealed? 
An early suggestion, never taken seriously, was that the lantern was actually concealed within the church. But in that case, a mirror would be needed to throw the picture back onto the wall. I tried it with a shaving mirror fixed to the window of an outhouse. We know there was a window with a shelf just like this in the church at Knock, and so this setup could have worked. Here's the effect it produced on an August night in a Cambridge village in 1987. One down, but how many others are there still to go? The paranormal is a hydra-headed creature. You explain away one case, and a hundred others rise to take its place. If scientific research can't provide decent evidence, if publicly attested miracles are unreliable, perhaps we have to look elsewhere for fraud-proof evidence. What about the more everyday phenomena that so many people experience for themselves? In our survey, one in three reported events in their own lives that require some other kind of explanation. A fortnight after my sister died, I went to bed and she appeared smiling. Then before I could speak, she vanished. It often happens. I'm thinking about someone I haven't thought about for a long time, and suddenly they're on the telephone with the same thought. I went to a medium. She said I would meet someone, where we would meet, and what his initials would be. It was incredible because it turned out to be my husband. Fortune-telling is one of the most common and impressive areas in which people claim first-hand evidence of paranormal powers. One in ten people have had a tarot reading. One in three believe firmly in astrological prediction. One in four have consulted a professional palm reader, and I tried it for myself. Since you've never done this before, some of the things I tell you might seem a little strange. They stra they're also going to be strange to me. Mm -hmm. But believe me, they mean something for you. And sometimes you're going to have to help me to make sense of it. Fine. You. If we work together, this is going to, I think we can come up with uh, whatever you need to know. The hands can tell us a lot because the outside shape of your hands show that you're a person who is very much interested in details in the fine grain aspects of projects of various kinds. Uh, you're also, we can tell also, are you right-handed or left-handed? I'm right-handed. You're right-handed, okay. Uh, they say that the left hand is what you're born with and the right hand is what you've done with it. Uh, forceful thumb, it's a very stubborn thumb. You like to have your own way. Uh, it's wasted, what we call wasted by that means that you notice that it, it comes in here, the second joint comes in like that. And what that tells us is that even though you're a very stubborn person, and in fact you will never give in, you always have to have it your own way, you are diplomatic about doing it. And you will give the appearance of being flexible. But it's also a way of making sure it's going to come out your way. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sometimes called a diplomat, diplomatic thumb. Now this is your heart line. It tells us the quality of your emotional attachments, are your feelings, uh, also physically the status of your heart. Uh, this shows that you're a person who doesn't, um, at least at the beginning, didn't concentrate his affections or attachments to any one person. You, in, in this country, you, you play the field, as we call it. Uh, in your other hand, your fate line, you notice, is, uh, goes beyond this and goes all the way up here. Yes. You notice that? Yes. Around, a little after age 40, you are retired. So that was at 40, was it? Yes, at that's, 40. When I, that, that's when I left my university job. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, so something you've chucked that was going to be your whole career, and then uh, this has been a pretty good reading, you would say, right? Well, it's not bad. I mean, it's, 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 it's well above chance, anyway. Okay. And that's usually the, the, the reaction I get. Uh, most of my students, when I do it for them, they, they give me a rating of about 96, actually. <laughs> uh, Ray Hyman is not genuinely a palm reader at all. He's a professor of psychology. He suggests it's possible for anyone to become a successful psychic by following some simple rules. Rule one, get the client to cooperate. You, you do that by subtle clues, by the way you handle the situation, but this is your turf. This is your place. They're coming into your world. And at this point, they're, they're, they're looking for clues on how they're supposed to behave. And you're going and you, you, you're to give them clues on how they're supposed to behave. And, and part of it is that, that this is a cooperative venture. Rule two, use commonplace information. Well, I always tell people to use the scar on the left knee, Floyd. 
Uh, you can begin by, like I said, I, see, I say, I, I gather you have a scar in your left knee, and most people, if they don't have it on the left knee, it's on their right knee. I mean, if they go through life, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Rule three: use flattery. Uh, you do flatter them. That's a that's a rule. But you got to be careful how you flatter them. And one way, let me give you a, one way I flatter people is I tell them when I look at their hand, I say, now, see, I can tell you're the kind of person who really doesn't like to be flattered. Rule four: exploit your client's reactions. I watch your reaction, of course. By the way, palm reading is excellent for that. Many of my people whose palms I read, when I'm telling them things they want to hear, they keep shoving their palms towards me. Yes. When I'm telling them things they don't want to hear, <laughs> they, they withdraw. keep only withdraw. Yeah. And you get other clues like that from people. You pick that up. Rule five, pretend to know more than you do. No matter what you say to me, I say, yes, I knew that. You know, I, I act as if I already knew it. So you're not telling me anything. You never surprise me. I never act surprised by anything you tell me. If we can be so easily taken in about ourselves, would it be surprising if we were sometimes to misread the facts of the external world? Indeed, who hasn't come across experiences like these taken from our survey? The lampshade started moving, and people were walking down the stairs. My grandson got very frightened and said he could see something. When I was a child, I used to hear a man with a wooden leg getting nearer and nearer, though he never appeared. I felt someone trying to wake me up, I sat up and saw a young girl about 10 years old in a long white dress with wispy, gingery hair. She was transparent and danced round the curry cot while the baby was asleep. When I sit down to watch television in my late wife's place, sometimes I have a feeling that the door has opened and I see a shadow that walks past me. I know it is my wife. What we've been hearing in these accounts of personal experience are, of course, stories about what people thought they saw or heard. They experienced something and took it to be a ghost or a precognitive dream or a case of ESP. But what we take something to be isn't, of course, necessarily a good guide to what it is. Seeing is believing, people say. But look at this. The arrow rotates continuously in one direction while the window appears to go into reverse. It's because you assume you're looking at a rectangular-shaped window when in reality you're not. All right, that's an illusion designed to take advantage of the brain's mistakes. But surely we're safe to assume that the real world isn't going to cheat us in this way. That's true, it isn't going to happen most of the time. But then, by definition, paranormal experiences aren't reported most of the time. It may be precisely the exceptions that catch us off our guard. We're back in Ireland with another phenomenon involving the Virgin Mary. But this time, I'll vouch for it myself, there can be no question of trickery or fraud. For two weeks now, the claimed phenomenon has drawn crowds of eight or so thousand each evening to the grotto on the edge of the little village, after two local ladies saw what they took to be movement in the statue. And as the word spread, the crowds grew. Now a 24-hour vigil is kept up, and a local committee has had to be established to control the crowds which travel from all over the country every evening. Believers say that after 10 o'clock in the evening, the statue is seen to move in a human way from the waist up, moving its arms and head. Others see the face of Christ superimposed on the statue. It's said that about three quarters of those who go to the shrine see some apparent movement. I didn't see it for six weeks afterwards. I didn't. I was over here one night on the hill here, and I saw her do this, her head over like that on her shoulders. And I didn't see it for ages afterwards again. I got a fright when I saw the movement. I thought it was going to fall out of the canopy. It was moving forward, backwards, sideways, and um, everyone looking up in amazement. Shortly after 10 o'clock, I realized that something wasn't right up at the statue. And in actual fact, what I saw at that point was not just movement of the statue or appeared movement, but to me, the statue on a few occasions was, it appeared to be suspended in the air, and in actual fact, Ridiculously, it appeared to be quite out of the grotto. She is quiet enough now, but last night I stood down below in the drizzling rain and looked up at this concrete statue of the Virgin Mary. And within a few seconds, the lighted halo around her head had begun to shimmer and then to undulate as if it was being blown by a light breeze. 
I rubbed my eyes and looked again. And this time, the statue herself, Our Lady, had almost come to life. She was trembling, rocking her head quite widely from side to side. It wasn't just me that saw it. All six members of our camera crew saw the same thing and were equally surprised. We didn't have to stare at it for, at it for a long time. The effect was just as strong from ten foot away as it was from across the valley. None of us are Catholics or believers. I said I'll vouch that it's not fraud, but equally I'll vouch that it's not real. While I and other witnesses were seeing the movement, the camera on its fixed tripod was recording the objective fact, and through the camera's lens there was nothing surprising to be seen. If the camera doesn't see it, but we do, it means, presumably, that the movement isn't in the statue, but in ourselves. But why? The first reason is that our bodies sway when we're standing. But since we're not usually aware of this movement, especially in the darkness, we don't allow for it in making sense of what we see. When the image moves on the screen, as if you yourself were swaying, naturally enough, the Virgin seems to move. But the statue and the halo move together. What I saw was that the statue seemed to move within the halo. This is because our eyes respond more quickly to bright lights than to dim. Here, for example, the lower part of the bar seems to lag behind the upper part, although in reality the bar is completely vertical. At Ballon Spittle, the face of the statue is in fact much dimmer than the halo. Now, when the whole image is swung from side to side, you may see a strange effect, with the head rocking around within the halo. If you're not seeing it, try turning off the room lights. And if we produce a movement more like the jiggling that would naturally occur in someone staring at the statue, the effect will be even clearer. This is very much the kind of effect I personally witnessed. Yet it can't be the whole story of the Ballon Spittle Virgin, for though I didn't see it, other witnesses have claimed that sometimes it was much more than plain movement that was seen. It wasn't the statue, it was the figure of um, a man dressed in dark robes. And there was a lady beside us who had a pair of binoculars. And uh, I asked her for the loan of the binoculars because I wanted to clarify what I had seen. And uh, I looked through the binoculars and I just saw the same figure of a man in dark robes. And uh, this time the face was covered with his two hands, and I could see the hands. I could even see the fingernails covering his face. And the head was covered with some type of a turban or a cloth. It might be that this strange story was simply in her mind. People were looking for something grand at Balance Spittle. Once the idea of strange happenings has got off the ground, imagination vies with the reality to conjure up ever more exotic interpretations of events. The colouring of perception by preconceived beliefs is probably the single most important factor here. Certainly the tendency to see what we expect accounts for many ghost stories. You wouldn't think there was anything sinister about this pub, but when Mrs. Campbell Wilson and her husband took it a few weeks ago, they soon discovered that the cheery atmosphere of the bar wasn't the whole story. There may not have been anything to worry the customers, but Alec Wilson was soon convinced the place was haunted. They'd both lost so much sleep that Mrs. Wilson often dozed at the bar. She came to dread closing time, fearing what the ghost had in store that night. Our expectations are extremely powerful. So, for instance, if, um, if a person goes into a haunted castle, uh, particularly if their belief system is such that they think that there might be ghosts there, then all kinds of things can be perceived, not, not just interpreted. I mean, I think there's a big difference here. Perceived as ghostly. And again, getting back to, to myself, uh, I have been alone in strange houses at night where I have heard someone walking in the house, turn the light on, and I've known that this is a water pipe creaking, as, or, or the, the, the boards creaking as the house cools down at night. But in the dark, I can sit and listen, and exactly the same sounds sound like footsteps. 
three of the martyrs were imprisoned at the inn the night before they were burned. The story goes that their spirits haven't let the old place forget it. So, after a few nights at the checkers, nobody scoffs at ghosts anymore. Just before we go to sleep and just as we wake up, those are two prime times when people are likely to experience, uh, you know, full-blown full visions of things. So these periods of, of sleep are called hypnagogic sleep and hypnopompic sleep, respectively. And everyone has these periods from time to time. We don't normally notice them in any dramatic way, but it's, it really reflects uh, sort of a change in control in the brain. The, the higher parts of the brain are, are being turned down and the, the lower parts uh, taking more control. What happens is that it's very difficult to sort out reality and fantasy. And so a person may feel that they're absolutely wide awake. If they're wide awake, if they think their eyes are open, they're seeing this, then it's real. Such tricks, wrote Shakespeare, hath strong imagination, that in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed a bear? Late on Christmas night, 1980, a star-like object was seen to fall to Earth. Not in itself such a remarkable event, but the consequences, once human imagination had got to work, were quite extraordinary. For seven years, people have been claiming that the object that came to Earth that night was nothing other than an extraterrestrial UFO, and that all the evidence for this close encounter has been deliberately hushed up. The actors in the drama were men of the United States Air Force, stationed at Woodbridge, Suffolk. Not the place that you'd expect to find dreamers or romantics. But maybe it was their very alertness to the possibility of enemy invasion that made these airmen especially vulnerable to their own fears. Around three o'clock in the morning, security police had seen the star-like object apparently landing in the nearby forest. Thinking that an aircraft might have crashed, the duty officer sent three men to investigate. Armed with automatic rifles, the American airmen entered what was to them foreign territory outside the base. To their utter consternation, they encountered a mysterious glowing object in the forest. It had a blue flashing light on its upper deck and other white lights around its undercarriage. As they approached, it maneuvered through the trees and disappeared. Two days later, Colonel Holt, the deputy base commander, mounted a second expedition in the middle of the night. The conversation was recorded. Colonel Holt's party again saw mysterious lights, one light that was red and winked on and off, one that was white and flashed. Through the gloom, the airman even saw Colonel Holt communicating with aliens. After a lapse of three weeks, Colonel Holt filed this memorandum. Besides the lights, Holt had found physical traces of the UFO. It wasn't until 1983 that the memorandum finally leaked out. What might be the true explanation? The star-like object that seemed to crash into the wood was a satellite re-entering the atmosphere. But how about the other lights the airmen saw? Over there to the northeast, there's a row of wireless masts. At night, they show red beacons on the top. When Colonel Holt's party saw a red UFO, could it possibly be that they were simply seeing those beacons through the trees? And then, over there on the horizon, about five miles distant, there's a lighthouse at Orford Ness. Couldn't the lighthouse beam sweeping through the woods have been the white, flashing UFO? Skeptics have long held that the presence of the lighthouse, directly in line with the supposed spacecraft sighting, is all that's required to wrap this story up. The Orford light 
flashes every five seconds. Here's a film of the lighthouse accompanied by the tape recorded voices. The lighthouse theory works better than you might expect, but it hardly works well enough to account for the clear description of the spacecraft, especially the blue flashing light. I suspect there's still another explanation. Unknown to the US Airmen, somebody that Christmas night had called the police, and as this letter from the chief constable confirms, around four in the morning, two officers attended in a squad car. In the words of one of the main UFO witnesses, it was like nothing man-made. There was a blue light on top, with red lights and a white light in the middle. It moved from the forest into a small field, where it made some cows run around in panic, then let out a sudden intense burst of white light and shot away at tremendous speed. The color was dirty white. There was definitely something inside it, I don't know what. The shapes did not look human. Maybe they were robots. What are the chances of all these elements coming together in one time and place? If it hadn't actually occurred, I'd have said they were practically zero. But the fact is, it did occur right here. I suspect it's almost always the same with those dramatic events that are seen later as being the showpieces of the paranormal. People and circumstances just happen to have combined in the right way. But over and above the special factors that have to have been present, there's one factor that's always there. Namely, the human urge to tell a good story. But there's no question that paranormal stories are good stories. In fact, as we all know, they're some of the greatest stories ever told. But why? What is so good about the paranormal? Why would so many of us like all this nonsense to be true? Humanity, said G.K. Chesterton, will not perish through want of wonders, only through want of wonder. Perhaps the place we should start wondering is at ourselves. These statues stand in the village of Brangston in Northumbria. The cement menagerie, as it's called, is a monument to the human capacity to fantasize. John Fennington was in his 80th year when he began it. His wife had died. He had a retarded, invalid son who lived with him at home. Old John, as he was called, set to work to create an alternative reality in his backyard. Give a man the tools and he'll finish the job of making his own imaginary world. And why? What's it for? It shows us how the human mind balks at infirmity and old age balks at dullness, balks at the constraints of realists who tell us that angels and the Loch Ness Monster don't exist. Here they do. Here anything you like exists and any kind of connection is allowed. The great Elizabethan physician, Sir Thomas Brown, said this, We carry within us the wonders that we seek without us. All Africa and her prodigies are within us. Here, if you like, is a concrete expression of the fairyland that lay within an old man's mind. And isn't that essentially where so much of the paranormal starts? Whether it's UFOs, a moving virgin, or a misunderstood young girl, it's our imagination that's furnishing the paranormal world. Furnishing it always with something grander, more satisfying, more godlike than reality or scientific laws allow. California is the most technically sophisticated place on Earth. Is it an accident that it's here that hopes are highest for a new age of non-science?
The store sells magic potions, wands, and spells. It's run by an ex-policeman, Dr. Nelson White, with his wife, Anne. They're both wizards and bishops in the church they personally founded. The shop has to cater to all the broad spectrum of the occult community, so we have material here from perhaps two dozen different systems. Not necessarily systems we ourselves practice, although we do feature our own system, especially in our books, that you've seen some of the books that we've written. Can you tell us about some of the things, like, for example, the floor washers, which are on sale over there? Um, they're uh, essentially a tool. A person would uh, use them in a ritual con condition and wash the floor or their clothes or whatever has to be washed to remove whatever influence it is they wish to remove or put in an influence that they wish to put in. Uh, some people uh, sprinkle it outside their door or outside their window or around their car or whatever it is. That, it depends what they're doing. These are all tools. Uh, they, they're they not uh, a, an infernal device that goes off by itself. You, it, they're simply tools that the person uses in a variety of methods. And would somebody come to you say, and say, well, I'm being bugged by my mother-in-law or something. What can you give me to keep her, <laughs> keep her away? Yes, well, th that happens. Uh, Mother-in-law's ex-boyfriends, uh, uh, what not. Uh, there are materials that would be conducive to that, but again, it's the person that makes it work. We do our part, too. We put influence into everything whenever we can, and that's what this finger is for. It's a discharge finger, these two, and when I uh, charge up a candle or an oil or something, I use this, hopefully, to augment energy to stay in the tools so that they can put their energy in and uh, it will work for them. Across town, Taryn Creve caters for a different class of Californian. Trance channeling, the latest fashion in the psychic world, is Victorian spiritualism in a new guise, even down to the Red Indian spirit guide. Here, Miss Creve is about to act as a channel for messages and advice from a 300-year-old Hopi Indian called barking tree. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is barking tree. And would there be a question to begin, please? Do you wish to ask a question? My name is Irwin. And welcome, Irwin. I would like to know if my spirit guides have a message for me. Very good. Just a moment. Uh, you are getting ready to make some very important breakthroughs. Uh, this will be happening physically and also spiritually and uh, emotionally for you. Uh, you have quite an ability right now, uh, quite a creative control, more than you have previously recognized over what will be coming into your life. You will have much but does she think these spirit guides really exist? I think that they exist in another kind of plane of existence. It's in a different sort of a reality than we're in. I think that ultimately what matters is the information that comes through. That ultimately, if the information is serving people, if it's helping people, then it doesn't really matter if it's coming from me and I'm deluding myself into thinking that there's a spirit or if it's coming from a spiritual being that's really coming through. Yes, hi Celeste, I'm Ray. Welcome, Ray. Hi. Uh, my grandfather passed away a week ago suddenly. I was wondering if you had any messages for me at this time. His name, please? Ellis J. Another guide is coming through. Celeste, an English lady. He was ready to go. He was uh, happy to leave. Uh, he is feeling actually quite peaceful and quite harmonious at this time. It is important for the others in the family to remember that it was his choice. Life and death are things which happen, not by accident, but by choice. There's no end to the opportunities on offer. Above all, people seem to be looking for connectedness, the sense that the world is ultimately one, and that there are ways we can all become part of a kind of cosmic consciousness. Sit in 
is. Tell us about the pyramid. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to feel the energies that the shape of this pyramid have caused to be concentrated and focused in this area. When I step into here with any worries, then they go away. They just melt. Can you transmit it to me? Okay. Rupert Sheldrake is a theoretical biologist who's also a leading exponent of the philosophy of the New Age, with his own unorthodox views about the vital forces that control the whole of life. I asked him what he thinks lies behind the modern quest for an alternative, non-scientific picture of our world. I think that people are looking for the connections between themselves and nature and themselves and other people. And to go beyond what many would see as the fragmented view of things that the mechanistic theory in science has brought about within our culture. I think that the common sense of science is a common sense that has its own kinds of invisible connections. Um, gravitational force. Every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter in the universe. And you couldn't have a more interconnected principle than that. It's the basis of Newtonian physics. Uh, electromagnetic connections, which are known until um, 100, well, 150 years ago. No one would have dreamt it possible that things like television or radio could have happened. So at any given time, anyone who says the kinds of interconnection admitted by science are the only kinds there are, um, is, I think, historically speaking, on rather a, a, a sticky wicket, because whenever people have said that in the past, they've been superseded by the advances of science itself as new kinds of interconnection are discovered. I don't think there's any reason to assume that science has plumbed the depths of nature or of the human psyche. I think there's a great deal that's still unknown, and therefore I think it's a reasonable presumption that uh, there are forms of interconnection between ourselves and, within, and between ourselves and nature and within nature, which science doesn't yet know about. The view that everything is connected to everything else is unquestionably attractive, but in point of fact, demonstrably false. Why are we such optimists about the possibility of paranormal forces in the world? Let's take the case of gravitation. It's true, of course, that every body in the universe, including human bodies, exerts a pull on every other one. These children are exerting a gravitational attraction, not only on the others in the playground, but also on their mothers miles away. But the effect, of course, is minuscule and provides no basis for communication. How then does the idea of psychic connectedness arise? The simplest answer is that it's an idea that all human beings start out with and never really lose. The Swiss psychologist Piaget said that every human child below the age of five or so thinks in a magical, holistic way. There are three little bears. No, it's three little bears. Yeah, three little bears. Children are, as it were, born optimists about the world they live in. They expect the world to hang together as one story. And of course, it's essential that they should do, because it's only by looking for connections that they'll learn what's really connected and what isn't. In that sense, growing up is about disappointment, learning that some things aren't allowed that people can't walk on water, that ghosts don't exist, that the wish is not necessarily the father to the deed, that mummy doesn't know your inner thoughts, and that in the last analysis, every human being is on his own. One with shivers, <laughs> a giant key, and a moving wall. It's a scary sort of cave, isn't it? Well, I don't know, it's for winding up the cave. Yet perhaps, and Sheldrake, I expect, would say this, it's a mistake for us to be too grown up. Isaac Newton himself was described as a childlike sage. Newton's mother left him at the age of two, and it's even been suggested that his whole theory of gravitational action at a distance was based on his longing to make contact with her. 
He was an alchemist, a mystic, a man who believed so firmly in the unity of nature that he refused even to accept the three parts of the Holy Trinity and insisted that the Godhead must be one. Several of his non-scientific speculations, such as this extraordinary book of prophecies, have been described by later commentators as frankly childish. Maybe Newton could do what he did in other areas precisely because he retained into adulthood this primitive, childlike belief in there being more magic in the world than he could ever know. I do not know what I may appear to the world, Newton wrote, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the whole ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Among geniuses, magical thinking has never really gone away. Many artists, especially, have looked for truth in the world of the paranormal. Most have kept their mysticism under wraps. The poet, W. B. Yeats, was an exception. Yeats not only believed in paranormal powers, he openly espoused occultism, table-turning, spirit mediumship as a source of poetic inspiration. In this tower in the west of Ireland, where Yeats lived with his wife, the top floor was set aside as a room for communing with spirits and practicing trance meditation. Could we have had Yeats the poet without Yeats the mystic? The two aspects of the one man were inseparable. The mystical life, he wrote, is the center of all that I do and all that I think and all that I write. Yeats would have no truck with science. John Keats complained that Newton had unweaved the rainbow. Maybe these romantic writers knew little about the childlike quality of science itself. William Blake was scornful of the skeptics. Mock on, mock on, Voltaire Rousseau, he wrote. Mock on, mock on, tis all in vain. You throw the sand against the wind, and the wind blows it back again. The poets have always sided with the paranormal, and I suspect that most ordinary people have sided with the poets. But here's what W. H. Auden wrote. What makes it so difficult for a poet not to tell lies is that in poetry, all facts and all beliefs cease to be true or false and become simply interesting possibilities. The question is, what do we want, poetry or science? And to say we want both is too easy an answer. Of course we want both. No human being can live by science alone. But if we're going to live by lies, by interesting possibilities, I, for one, want to know if and how and when I'm being deceived. Experiences one has of the universe are so much more than measurement and uh, computation and the mechanized responses of the machine age. They are deep experiences of love and of beauty and of awe and of terror and of beholding this marvel and that is something that is not susceptible of disproof. You can't disprove an experience. Ultimately we, we have these needs, we have to satisfy them. Paranormal beliefs may satisfy them now. I don't think they're the best way to satisfy them. And I guess I think what, what we have to do as a civilization is to find some better way, if we can, if it's possible, to satisfy those needs without having to sort of, um, you know, push our logic into the background or be a little bit embarrassed because we know that it doesn't quite make logical sense. Because in my mind, the, the, the evidence for the paranormal has accumulated over 100 years is so weak that any reasonable person with a little bit of knowledge of methodology would, would not believe that on that basis, on the scientific basis, there's anything there. We will all be dead and gone in 50 years from now, but psychic phenomena will stay because it exists. And sooner or later, when, uh, when the electronical advancement in mankind and the human brain will advance, that we will be able to capture some phenomena on actually computers and devices and machines, they're going to say, okay, so we always, they always throughout the centuries, they said that psychic phenomena exist, and it really exists. Okay, what's next? That's evolution. So the skeptics really missed the boat. I lost uh, my parents uh, 
a few years ago. I miss them terribly. Uh, I would love to have uh, five minutes a year uh, talking with them, tell them how the grandchildren are, you know, make sure they're all right wherever they are. I mean, I find that very appealing. But precisely because I find it appealing, I know I'm vulnerable to, uh, to organized deception by mediums and, and others. Now, that's a decision I've made for myself. Uh, I don't think uh, it's my place to tell others that uh, they're deceiving themselves by, by going to a medium or imagining that they somehow can make contact with, with the spirits of uh, loved ones that, that have died. Uh, I think everyone has to make that decision for themselves. But if I'm asked, I'll be happy to tell you what I think. And what I think is that there's a, uh, a large body of entrepreneurs who prey upon people who are vulnerable on this issue and that it's a scam.